My name is Pastor Russ. If I've not had the opportunity to meet you, welcome. We're honored that you've taken some time out of your weekend to join us as we open up God's Word. We are going to be in and have been in a series that's looking at how do you not drift from the main thing. Um, It is easy in life to start with clear eyes, with a clear goal, with clear vision, and to drift from the main thing, uh, becoming anything but the main thing. And I've been there as a parent, I've been there as a husband, I've been there as a Christ follower, Uh, I've been there as a Walmart shopper, to where I went in with one thing in mind, but I came out with a lot of things except for the one thing that was in mind whenever I went in. Uh, We believe that at the end of the day, your goals are good, but your habits tell you more about where you're going than what your goals that you've written down on paper tell us about where you're going. Goals are aspirations mission statements, their dreams about what you hope will be realized, but habits tell us really the path that you're on and the destination you're heading towards in your life. So tell me your goals and show me your habits, and we can probably look at the likelihood of you making it to where you want to go. If your goal is to lose 15 in the next three, but you have a habit of around 8.30 every single night saying hi to my friend Mayfield, and his friend Nestle, the chocolate chip cookie, then chances are your habit is going to keep you from your goal, no matter how much you have written down on paper and thought about it and made a Pinterest wall in honor of it. You see, we, we want to have habits and values that drive the way that we make choices, that drive the way that we divide our time. All of us have a limited amount of time in It's our uh, joy to steward in a way that would glorify and honor God and make the most of the time that he has given us. Are you tracking with me? And so at Four Points Church, we exist to reach the least, the lost, and the lonely with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Least, lost, and lonely people are messy people. They're broken people. They don't act like Jesus. They don't often say the things that Jesus would say. And we're not shocked when people who are in the process of becoming more and more like Jesus are outwardly flawed in this church. Now, I can't speak for everyone because some people still want to come in and like side-eye people because they are hiding their life better than others are in its broken areas. Uh, But we want to be the kind of church where we welcome people in their broken state who are in the process of being made into the image of Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you are broken, we'd rather you be honest and cover it up. I have a friend. He was the greatest barber I've ever uh, been around and experienced. He was a bald-headed man that was kind of a mercenary soldier for years, tatted from head to toe, and he was the best hair cutter ever. He didn't have hair, but he could cut hair better than anyone I ever met. And um, he had a lot of back pain because as a barber, you stand on your feet for seven, eight hours a day cutting hair. And he had tried different things. They have these barber pads that you put down that are supposed to be gentler on your feet. He had gotten sketchers because when you get old, you don't care about being cool. So you just wear sketchers. Like he had, he had tried all of the stuff. Uh, and, and he was rough around the edges, but he genuinely loved the Lord. And so this guy came in and asked if he could pray that God would heal his back. And kind of skeptical. Uh, he said, yeah. He sat down in the barber chair, and we were there, and this guy just starts praying for him. And he's kind of looking at me like, is something weird about to happen? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, like, let him pray. And so as he was praying, uh, the guy's, uh, my, my friend's back, it like all of a sudden, without him touching or anything, I was there, it just popped, like a loud popping noise. And, and, and Dave, uh, being still newer in his faith, yelled out a not-so-godly word. To which the guy on the ground said, did you just cuss in my prayer? And Dave said, the Lord knows my heart. Uh, The truth is, we're a lot more messy than we like to appear to be. And just because you show up on Sunday and cover up well doesn't mean that you're not a mess. And we just believe that we're going to heal a lot faster if we're honest than if we cover up and lie. You know, when it's in the darkness and we keep our hands closed around it, we don't find deliverance from it. So we want to be the kind of people that bring our messes to God, even if it's inconvenient and messy for the community around us. And so in order for us to not become a church that begins to side-eye people who are messy, we believe there are some driving values that keep us focused on loving and welcoming the least, the lost, and the lonely. The first of which we talked about two weeks ago, that is that we are going to be the kind of church that leads with love. 
What does that mean? Christ demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. It's not his wrath that makes us turn to him. It's his love that makes us turn to him. And God is active in his love towards us because he desires that we would know that his desire for us individually in Christ Jesus is that we would be reconciled to him, forgiven of the sin that we have done, set free from the life that we are living in bondage to sin so that we can now live a life by the spirit of God that would honor and glorify him. My iPad's going dark on me over and over again. I don't know how to fix it. Anyone know how to keep it from going dark? Tech help? It's okay. I'll just keep touching it frequently. Here's the point. (laughs) Here's the point that I'm after. We want to be the kind of church that leads with the love of Christ. Therefore, we need to be loved by God because before we can give God's love, we've got to know God's love. Many of you, the reason you can't extend God's love is because you don't know that you're madly loved by God. When you know you're madly loved by God, it then invites you into this response of loving God. So when you know God loves you, then you get to turn and love God. And when you love God, that leads you into a love that naturally goes to, bring it up now, others, which is the end game. That you would find a love within you that's not derived from you being a good person, but from the God who is at work in you, giving you a love for impatient and imperfect people that you can extend to them. So we lead with love, which means we know that we're loved by God, therefore we love God, and because God has loved us so greatly, it leads us to the second part of a great commandment that he gave in the Bible, which is that we would, in that love, love our neighbor as our self. So we lead with love, number one. We believe that keeps us focused on reaching the least lost in London with the gospel of Jesus Christ. On top of that, the second value that we looked at last week is that we are to be a church that lives open-handedly, which means that we're owners of nothing but stewards of everything. What does that mean? What does that look like? Praise God. Uh, what, <clears throat> for such a time as this, God appointed Corey to be here. Um, uh, what, what does that mean to live a life that's open-handed? It, it, it means that Because Jesus is the greatest treasure of our hearts, we no longer treasure the things of this earth. Instead of taking creation, which God stakes a claim to as owning all of it, and then using it for our glory, we now believe that all of creation points to his glory, and we get to join in in the worship as creation's worshiping God in his glory with giving God great glory in our hearts worship. And so we believe that every moment, every minute of your life, you worship. It's what you were created to do. The question is not, are you worshiping? The question is, what are you worshiping? And we believe that you've been created to worship God and not things. And so we want you to take your hands off of your time in retirement, which people can get really greedy with. We want you to take your hands off of your gifts, off of your abilities, off of your work, and open-handedly live in a way that offers all of it to God because you know that whatever is in your hands is already a gift that God has given you. Whenever we live open-handedly, then we can be generous to our neighbor. We can be loving to our neighbor. Many people think that open-handedness is about the giving value of the church. It's about you being a giving person, not just a giving person in church. For many of you, just because you threw some spare change in your pockets in a box in the back doesn't make you a generous person. You can still be a very greedy person. Uh, uh, Dr. Timothy Keller, who passed away this week, he's one of my favorite pastors of all time. He got to hear the words, well done, thy good and faithful servant, and he got to enter into eternal rest with the Lord. He preached a sermon on greed, and in his sermon on greed, he went back and found and looked in all of the church annuals of church discipline to find if there ever was a moment where a church disciplined someone for greed. (laughs) They found one case in the entirety of American church history. And it was of a man who, in his church, the community had gotten together and they had agreed that they would only make a 4% profit. And he decided that under the table he was going to start making a 5% profit. So the church held his feet to the fire and said, hey, we made a commitment that we were going to represent Christ in the way that we did business. And you're misrepresenting Christ. And they held him accountable to getting greedy. Now imagine if that standard was applied to you today. Imagine if you... Uh, were held to the standard that they were holding him to. I I think this is a beautiful thing, that we would be open-handed and generous to God, prayerful in our giving and open-handed in our possessing of anything that we have so that we can steward it to the glory of God. Today, I want to talk to you about our third value that keeps us focused on reaching the least, the lost, and the lonely, and that is that we are a people that pursue community. The Christian life is a communal life. It's meant to be lived together, and we know that which means a lot of us then start to check out and tune out because we know that we need 
others in our life to spur us on to God, good works and godliness. We have a one another faith. I think it's 58 unique occurrences. We have a call being given to us in the New Testament to do something in consideration of another. Love one another. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another. I mean, these one another's pop up all throughout the text, and you would think it's the most elementary stuff because basically it's Paul and Peter and John and others under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit saying, be nice to other people. Consider someone other than yourself. That's the Russ standard version. My point is you would think that we would be more considerate of others, but we by nature seem to be an inconsiderate people of others, and it makes it very difficult to want to live or to be embracing of community. And so this is the annual house cleaning sermon, where I invite you to consider the people that you have surrounded yourself with and ask some hard questions about whether or not it's the right people to be surrounded by. I had a senior pastor in California, he set me down whenever I was a young church planner, and he said, Pastor, I need you to know something. There's a lot of people that are going to demand your time, but there's this one group that you've got to be aware of. They're called the time suckers. They're going to come around and they're going to take everything they can from you, but they're never going to make a deposit back to you. And in your mind, you're going to think, man, these people are in need, and I just want to be compassionate and loving to them. But what you're going to discover is they have no desire to be well. They like being sick. They just want to see how long they can lay in your infirmary before you boot them out. It's a tough, tough wisdom. I was like, man, that seems ungodly. How, how unchristian to think about that. And then I got into ministry for about a year or two. And all of a sudden, I realized something. I had another one tell me that when you're a church planter, every weirdo that exists in the county that calls himself Christian will come to your church plant. And it got weird. I mean, it was weird. And people wanted my time, and they wanted it, and wanted it. And what it began to happen was the bigger priorities in my life became secondary. Loving Jesus and having a vibrant relationship with Jesus was secondary to loving his people. So I found myself empty because I wasn't prioritizing a love of Jesus and a pursuit of him in relationship before I was getting in front of people that needed his time. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places. Why? Because he needed to be alone with the Father, because he was living by the Spirit while he was on earth. Though he was fully God, he lived a life that was fully man, empowered by the Holy Spirit, so that we would know what the Christian life looks like, empowered by the Holy Spirit after he ascended to the Father. Are you tracking with me? And so he would withdraw to be refreshed in the presence of the Father. He prayed to be refreshed in the presence of the Father so that when he came back down, he could then distribute in ministry that to the needs of the people and minister to those that were around him. But for a lot of us, we get around time suckers that take, 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 take. They never give, and we continue to call them friends and family, and all they're doing is destroying us and keeping us from a healthy life. You've got to be careful about who you call friend. The book of Proverbs speaks to this, that a friend of many, that a, that a friend of many companions comes to ruin. And for many of you, you're loose with the word friend when you should be careful with who you call friend in your life. If you lived on this sun long enough, or if you lived on the sun, hey, if you lived on this earth long enough, rotating around the sun, you've likely called the wrong person friend a time or three and experienced its consequences. Whenever you realize they weren't actually that, but that they were there for something else in your life. So let me give you some breaking news. Jesus didn't hang out with everyone equally while he was here on earth. Some people got more time than others. And if you're going to steward the relational equity you have, you're going to have to get selfish with some of your time when it comes to who gets it. If you want to be relationally healthy, you've got to be mindful of who you give your relational equity to. While Jesus was on earth, he associated with three primary groups. Crowds, groups, and a few. Crowds, groups, and a few. And relationally, you need all three. You need it in your life. And I'm going to explain why briefly in just a second. But let me show you the people Jesus was around. Oftentimes, you would see him speaking and teaching to crowds of people. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, it says this. One day, Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds there. In Jewish culture, when a Pharisee would teach or a leader would teach, they would sit and the crowd would stand. It was to keep you from going to sleep. But some of you have gotten really good at sleeping standing, so we just gave up, and I stand, you sit. But my point, my point is Jesus often engaged in crowds. 
in those crowds, Jesus was uh, not always seen as the Savior. Not everyone was there because he was the Messiah. Some of them were there because he was the miracle worker. Some of them were there because, you know, they heard that this was the thing, and they had to come and check it out for themselves. But they didn't necessarily want Jesus. They definitely weren't at a point of devoting their lives to Jesus. They didn't want to be faithful to Jesus. They just wanted to see him to say, I was there. They wanted the T-shirt, but they didn't want the relationship. And there's nothing wrong with crowds. It's in crowds that we often hear about Jesus. My dad met Jesus in a crowd at a Billy Graham crusade back in the day in Charlotte, North Carolina. I met Jesus in a large crowd in a large church where I heard the gospel preached for about the 150th time. And all of a sudden the light went off and it made sense to me. And I moved from being a skeptic to a follower of Jesus. I moved from being a person going down one path to a person going down a completely different narrow path. I mean, I, I, I get there is a need for crowds. It's within crowds where we get motivated and inspired. It's within crowds uh, that we find a camaraderie of people that are around us. It's fun to walk around in the fall and just randomly in a crowd of people over in Clemson, South Carolina, just start going, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then like 16,000 people start going, C-L-E-M-S. That's fun. But if that's all you have, you're never going to be known. And none of those people are going to be there if there's not a game. So if all you have is a crowd, you may be inspired and motivated, but you, but you don't have anyone to call a friend when times get tough. So then you're, you're relationally under-equipped for the seasons of life that come. You see, crowds are always around, but they're frequently changing. If you're in the crowd, you're not familiar with them, and they aren't familiar with you, which sometimes is a breath of fresh air. Finally, people don't know me. I can just be here. But that's not good long-term. You need spaces where you're known. And within those spaces, you need spaces where you're intimately known. So we got crowds. Jesus engaged in crowds. You can find fair weather fans in crowds. They're there for a moment, but not a season. I mean, think about this. Some crowds are small, like the lepers that come to Jesus and he heals them. Only one comes back because they wanted to thank Jesus. The rest just wanted what Jesus could give them. They were just in the crowd. It was a transaction, not a relationship. So you have crowds. Then, then you have groups. Out, out of these crowds, Jesus eventually calls a group of 12 to come and be his disciples. In Luke chapter 6, verse 13 and 16, and this group takes up the majority of Jesus' time. If you're going to a trivia night this week, the question may be, what are the disciples? And no one maybe remembers, and they're throwing in reindeer names and stuff. You can know now Luke 6 is where you want to go. You might want to bookmark that one. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples, and he chose out of that group 12 of them to be his apostles. So these were the people that he spent the majority of his time with. He would engage with crowds during the day, but he would eat at the table with his disciples at night. He would engage in the crowds uh, during the day, but then he would go and sleep at night around his disciples, these apostles, this 12. And, and they saw more of his ministry. They recorded more of his works and, and, and have enabled us to know Jesus in a way because they were familiar with him in a way the crowd wasn't. Does this make sense? See, everybody needs a group, a group of people that you can get into a foxhole with, a group of people that you can endure through a hard season with. He gives us their names, Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, Judas Iscariot, who later would betray him. You see, the group, these are the people that you know them, you love them, and you share much of your life with them. In a group, you find community. In a group, you find healthy, good relationships. In a group, you find full tables on a Friday night. Because when you had nothing to do, you call them up and you go get tacos together. Uh, it's the group you choose to hang out with when the church, when your work, and your wife, or your husband, aren't telling you who to hang out with. Does that make sense? You, you want to be around them. You want to hang out with them. You see, these are your friends. You see, in a crowd, you learn that it's bigger than us because there's a good, healthy thing of knowing that it's bigger than you, right? But in a group, you're reminded that it takes all of us. Because just because it's big doesn't mean that you don't have an important part in it. And within your group, you're important. You give life. You speak life. You divide burdens. You multiply joys that are around it. Here's my question. Do you have a group or do you just have a crowd? Are you relationally exhausted 
because you're just running from all of these different people that are to some level impersonal, but none of them are the actual people you would choose to be with. And so you're giving your time to people at the end of the week, and like, you have someone that comes over, like, oh, man, I just keep running out of time to get with them. I, just want, I want to spend time with them. We just don't have time. Well, maybe it's because you're not stewarding your time well and your relational equity well enough to keep the people who should be in the space of being friends and in your group in your friend group. Are you tracking with me? This is not meant to be comfortable, and your silence speaks to the amen that I think is going on in the room. My point is, you need a group from within the crowd. Now, within the group, Jesus had a few. And the few saw Jesus at a level that none of us would have gotten to see him on earth. It, it's the three within the twelve that he withdrew with. They saw some of the most intimate moments. When Jesus was transfigured, it was Peter and John with him up on the mountain when he, his entire countenance and Moses and Abraham were there. That, they got to see that moment. Uh, when it was the end of Jesus' life and he was getting ready to go to the cross... It was the few that went further into the garden with him. Matthew chapter 26 speaks to that moment and that event. In verse 36 it says, Jesus went with them to the, to the Mount of Olives called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. How many of you have ever been in a season of life where your grief and the difficulty of it was so difficult that you didn't have the energy to read everyone in over and over and over again? So you had a group of friends that you loved, that you care about, that you would do anything for, but all of a sudden within them, there were a select few that you pulled in when you pushed everybody else out. That's your few. That's your few. I've got a few that don't live close to me, but the second they pick the phone up, I take the call. Uh, if they were in the middle of the night in a crisis, I would jump a plane and go. It's like we've just been woven together. And so we sacrifice at a level that's not normal. It's family-like. You see, your group become your friends, and I don't care what they teach you, your few become your family. Whether they are blood or not, they become your family. We've got some really jacked-up teaching we do in church that messes people up. For this reason, they shall leave their father and mother. Whenever your, your kids get married, they're, they're not joining your family, they're making their own. And the text teaches in Proverbs that there's a friend that sits closer than a what? You see, this is the beauty of what happens when you find your few. Your family, to some extent, has to be there. They don't have a choice. But your few choose to be there when everyone else walks away. They didn't have to show up, but they showed up. They didn't have to sit, but they chose to sit with you in whatever it is that you were going through. You see, you, you need crowds because in the crowd you're inspired. In the crowd you're motivated. In the crowd you're reminded of this truth that it's bigger than you. But, but you got to have within the crowd a group who are your friends, who, who remind you that it takes all of us, who are there to encourage you, who are there to walk with you, who are there to multiply the joys in your life. You, you need that smaller community of a group of people. But within that group... If you're really going to be healthy, I've learned in 38, almost 39 years of rotating around the sun, I've learned you're going to need a few who are that friend that the Proverbs speaks of that are closer than a brother, that were born for a moment of adversity. You see, it's the few that get really personal. It's the few that you don't save face in front of, you save your behind around them. You see, you don't, you don't do this in front of a crowd. If you're in a crowd on a Sunday, I'm like, how are you doing? And, and, and you were few honest, you would freak them out. The crowd around you will say, how are you doing? Our marriage is falling apart. I'm going to kill a dog and I'm probably going to get arrested for it because of Sarah whatever and that song she sang about beating dogs. We're about to have one of them. If he pees in my carpet one more time and bites another one of my children. The youngest one may have a demon in her, and my wife and I haven't had a date night in six months. I haven't read my Bible in three weeks, and I've uttered a few prayers, but most of them have been, help! How are you doing? You don't do that in a crowd, right? In a group, you call that unspoken.
Anybody struggling with porn addiction? Unspoken. Anyone's marriage need prayer? Unspoken. As they glare at them in the group. It was spoken. Right? You get around your few. How are you doing? Man, it's a struggle. I just walked off the stage after first service. And we're, we're, we're going through a struggle in the Chambers household right now. We got a lot of good things. But I, I'm afraid that we're out of whack right now. And um, it's my job, along with my wife, to graciously figure out what God would have us do and I don't, we're not batting a thousand here. So I walked off, and one of my few was backstage, Pastor Austin. He's like, how you doing? I'm like, not good. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm screwing up as a dad. I'm pretty confident of it. I don't think I'm prioritizing things right in my family right now. Like, we're, we're on edge because we are maxed out. I'm tired. My voice hurts to even talk right now. I'm spiritually in need of some refreshment. Like, it's not good, Austin. And he went, me too. And he just starts unloading, and I'm like, praying for you. He's like, I'm praying for you. And I walk out to hug and say hey to people. That, let me just be honest. That's what your pastor's living in and walking through. I'm being more transparent than maybe I'm supposed to be because I need you to know that that I believe is normal. And what you're doing by thinking that you've got it is what's killing you and it's not normal. The Bible talks about this whole thing about bearing one another's what? But that you just want to keep yours and take everybody else's too. Like you're some kind of Christian superhero. What up, She-Ra? We're glad you're here, warrior princess. <laughs> God's not looking for you to be some strong superhero. He's looking for you to be dependent and needy and clingy and, and, and hanging on him. Like, like the strongest Christians are the most humbly, like, like, like humble hanger. Like they hang on Jesus. Like they don't let go. And we look at those people like, oh, that ain't normal. They've been going through a hard time. No, they're, they're normal, and you're acting like you don't need Jesus. That's abnormal. That's not Christian. This whole idea that you got random seasons where you got it. Are you kidding me, Thunder? This is how we get into all the problems we keep getting into is because you got it. Like, stop trying to get it and start trying to cling to Jesus. That, that's, that's the point. And, and when you get the right few that come around you, they hold you accountable in a way that's not like abusive. When you go to a when you go to a crowd for accountability, it always becomes abusive. Here's a prescribe. Here's five things to do. To stop doing that. And then you come back and you're struggling, and it's like, well, what did you do? The five things. Because when you've got a crowd, listen, a crowd will give you advice, but they're not the ones that are going to spend hours praying for you. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. When you've got a few, though. You confess your sins to them. They don't pepper you with advice. They take the words of James seriously. They bend the knee right then and there, and they pray because when you confess your sins to one another and pray for each other, then he is faithful and just to heal us. And that's how we get there. If you needed advice, you could get Google and not a friend. But you need a few. So God, so God didn't call in advance of Google knowing everything and chat GPT taking away any need for you to have any kind of intellectual anything going on anymore. Just fog the mirror and type it in, and as a question, you can get it done. It's like the Bible knew you don't need advice. Your, your main problems in your life deal more <laughs> with trying to do apart from God than you simply stopping and abiding in God, which he says something in John 15 about, apart from me, you can do what? But yet we keep trying to do with advice stuff apart from God. And I, I just don't understand it. I, don't, I, I do this. I don't get why I do it. I'm like, what do I need for, to be a better parent? A little bit more advice. I'm going to read a parenting book. I'm going to listen to a parenting blog. I'm going to get on Pinterest and compare myself to other parents and die by paper cut in the comparison. Like, like what, what am I doing? What I need is the Holy Spirit. What I need is Christ in me. Last I checked, by grace through faith, I received Jesus at work in me, and everything that he's doing in me is already there. I had someone come to my office this week to, for counseling, and I know this may make me a bad counselor, but I'm, and this is confession time, so I'm just going to throw it out there. But I, I, I know they came and like, oh, I'm so glad you're, you're, I, I got some time with you. I've, I've come so you can fix my life. I'm like, I can't fix you. And they looked at me like, oh, yeah, you're being cute. One of them cute pastor moments. <laughs> but I'm here because I, I need some advice. I'm like, no, I, I, I'm not here to give you advice. I can testify to God's goodness in my weakness. I can point to how I can relate to your failure because I've seen God's goodness in my failure. I, I, I can point to the truth of what, the character of God and how it's not changed in spite of your circumstance. But, but at the end of the day, look, look all I'm going to do is galvanize either the work of Christ that's already in you, but I can't put the work of Christ in you if it's not there. I can't make it happen. So I can encourage galvanized catalyst to work of Christ for it to swell up within you so that you can begin to bear the fruit of God. But look, I can't fix you. 
I tried that the first 10 years in ministry. I was depressed, thinking about selling cars and quitting. So instead of fixing people, I decided I would testify to the work of God in me. And as God worked in me, maybe it could be an encouragement to people like you. And if we could get honest and share the work of Christ that's going on within us, we could galvanize and encourage and build each other up as we gather together in crowds and in groups and with a few. And that would hopefully help us stay the course to remember the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God that has not wandered away from us, though we wander away on a consistent basis. So here's where I'm at. Here's where I'm at. I'm trying to help you as a church get a good few. But here's the deal. I can't give you your few. I can give you a group. You can sign up for a group of strangers that can meet together, and then you can open the Bible, and around wanting to live a godly life, you can study the precepts and principles that are within that Bible, and as the Holy Spirit works, you'll come to know that there's some people that you enjoy and some people that you don't enjoy, but that doesn't mean that you're going to find your few. You see, in order to get your few, God's got to move in your life. If you don't have a few, the people that you can rely on, a friend that divides your burdens and is there in the most difficult times of your life, if you've not found that few yet, that's a prayer and an ask for God to move, not something that a pastor or a church can provide. But your job is to pray and ask God for it and to go to the spaces which have been created for you to find it. In this church right now, around 40% of our adults go to a group. Yet I feel complaints in this church about how it's growing exponentially and how people feel disconnected from people. I went to a group one time in 1996, Pastor, and it didn't work well. There was a strange lady that wanted to talk about her cat, and she monopolized all the time, so I quit. (laughs) I'm just going to throw out my favorite analogy. A lot of you, 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 you dated some stinkers, and you didn't quit dating. But you go to one group, and a crazy lady that wanted to talk about revelations for 17 weeks freaked you out because she was trying to cast something out of you one time. And in your mind, that means you should write off all of groups because, you know, that's crazy. Just crazy people go to them. Are you kidding me? I mean, some of you have been married more than once. And you didn't quit after the first one didn't work. I quit. You said that. A couple weeks later, ooh, I will swipe right. Swipe right. <laughs> Yet when it comes to, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to be very honest with you. Yet when it comes to Christian community, a lot of you are like, I went to a group one time. It was weird. I quit. I went to a group one time. They were hypocrites. You dated a bunch of hypocrites and you didn't quit. So why did you quit getting into a group? Because you found some people that weren't your mix of weird. You're a hypocrite too. You just didn't find your brand a hypocrite yet. I'm, I, I'm sorry. Jesus is coming back. We got to get this. Like, you need to figure this out, guys. Like, like you need community if you're going to be a healthy follower of Jesus. Otherwise, you will overlook sin that you should be repenting of. That's what happens. When you don't have good community, when there's no one that can tell you, hey, you ain't wearing no clothes right now. You walk around like a king with no clothes on looking like a fool. You need a healthy group. And my concern is that some of you, you don't have a healthy group, therefore you can't have a good few in your life. How do you know you got a good few in your life? Let me give you a few. A few, a few signs. And my notes have way more in them than I'm going to preach today. But here's the deal. How do you know you have a good few? When you have a good few, they help you stay the course. They see you wandering. They, they see good things becoming misprioritized things. They're like, hey, I, I think that's off. Hey, you, you, travel baseball is taking up 16 weeks in a row. I, I think that's a problem. I, I think that's misprioritized. I get it's just a season, but eight months of no church doesn't seem to be a good s- scenario for a healthy family. I don't think you're teaching your kids the right thing with that one. See, this is the problem. Some of you, if you got a few, you would run from them because you don't know, know what real, real love and real relationships look like. They would, in love, in loving Jesus and the church and you in that order, come to you and they would say to you, hey, I think you've missed the mark and you need to pull back. And they're not, they're not condemning you. They're willing to do the heavy lifting. They're willing to help you walk through it. They're willing to covenant and pray with you in it. But you push them away because they don't agree with what you think should be agreeable. Do you want to be healthy or do you just want a crowd of, na- a, a, a crowd of people to come around you for the good time that are never going to be there when you hit the bad time in your life? You see, guys, you need someone that can help you not wonder. This is why you get into a group. I don't get into a group because I need more Bible study. I can Google Francis Chan videos and watch them at home with my wife. There's a Bible study. 
You, it, it, it's essential. It's an important part. But my, my point is, we get into a group because you get other people that get to know you, and they look at you like, hey, I want what you want, right? We want Jesus. Yes, yes, we want Jesus. We want to raise our kids to love Jesus. Yes, yes, we want to raise our kids to love Jesus. Okay, let's go after that together. You can't get that on a screen. Francis isn't in your living room going, hey, I think you've wandered from that one a little bit. So Piper's not going to go, the glory of God in your living room and help you get back focused on it. But, but, but a good few will. A good few will. And you need someone that can knock on your door just because, man, man, I felt, I felt like something was off. Are you okay? Can I pray for you? I love you. I want, do you have a few? Let's speak to you whenever you wonder. Hebrews chapter 10 says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. See, a good few help you stay the course. How do you know you have a good few? Uh, a good few love you enough to tell you the truth. See, some of you only want the sweet kisses of a lie. So you surround yourself with liars and you don't have a good few. But a good few... They love you enough to tell the truth. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Oh, you're doing great. <laughs> it's awesome. Oh, you're married. It's not them. It's you. They, they always agree with you when you're arguing with your spouse if you have a bad few. Like, if you, like, I'm just going to be honest. You're not batting a thousand in your marriage. So if it's always been him or her and everyone around you is affirming, oh, it's, it's them. It's them. You deserve so much better. No, that's a demon speaking. They're trying to divide what God has brought together. And at the end of your wedding ceremony, the preacher said something like, let no man tear apart what God has brought. And you're calling that friend. You're taking the sweet kisses of a lie and you're cherishing as the truth of a heart, which is one of the biggest problems we have in our culture. How do you know you get a good few? They, they love you enough to go, man, I think you missed it on that one. I, I don't know that that's fully them. I, what else is going on in the story? If you have a good few, they're the kind of people that anchor down with you in adversity. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26 says, If one part of the body suffers, all parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all parts are glad. Never will forget the night my father-in-law died. I was given the task of driving from Moonville, South Carolina, up to North Greenville to pick my wife up. We were part of a church called Westside Baptist Church. They were one of the first churches I've ever been in that had a drum set. <laughs> Her daddy would get behind that drum set and they would play a uh, oh, victory chant. Anybody remember that? Hell, hell, I'm a Judah. And then there would be a response. Hell, hell. Y'all too white for that one? Hell, hell, I'm a Judah. Hell, hell, I'm a... How wonderful you are. And he'd get on that. Bah, 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 bah. And he was never classically trained. And you knew it because he would melt down in every field. It was awesome. <laughs> he was in a car wreck. And he had died. And my job was to pick Morgan up and take her to the house. And we pulled up to the house. And the few had assembled. You know what was amazing that night? No one gave anyone advice. In fact, the one lady that tried to give advice got ushered out of the house. <laughs> they came together and they wept and they sat and they mourned with us. That's a few. It's a few. They anchor down with you in adversity. How do you know you have a good few? You see Christ in them. Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Let me ask you this. If the people that you're calling your friends and your few were to be imitated by you, would you be more godly or less godly as a result of it? I'm asking for a friend. His name's Jesus. Um, that was way more funny than you think because it's serious right now. But seriously, if you were to mimic who you just spent the last, I don't know, 48 hours with, you chose to spend time with him, are you more like Christ or less? See, the, the idea, if you have the right few, is not that you're just sitting around on Fridays in Bible study, but that just you see Christ at work in them. You see the fruit of the Spirit through them, and as a result of being around them, you're more like Jesus. Surround yourself with those people. Invest in those people. Sacrifice for those people. See, that, that's the idea. 
My hope is that when you come to this crowd, you're motivated. But my hope is that when you leave this crowd, you have a group where you realize you have a part in it, where you're loved, where you're prayed for and heard. And and, and in time, my, my prayer would be that you would find a few. That in life's worst moments, you could pull in when you push everybody else out. Think about the disciples. Can you pull that text up? It was earlier in the sermon, Matthew chapter 26. You can push that, yeah. Matthew chapter 26. Think about this. These disciples that were around Jesus at the very end of his life. Let me find it. It was Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 to 38. It says this. Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. He said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John. They were his few. Jesus was about to have the Father turn his back on him. He was about to drink the cup of wrath for our sin. He was about to perspire blood. He was about to die the most gruesome of deaths, naked on a tree for our sin. He was about to be abandoned by everybody, even the few that he had with him. But before he was abandoned, within the twelve, he withdrew with the three. And look at what it says. As he walked away from the nine with the three, he became anguished, and distressed they got to see Jesus the son of God and all of his weakness and all of his neediness where he's he's literally saying stuff like father if it's possible that this cup could be taken from me and we've we've glamorized it with King James language and this is raw honest prayer from the son and the father father if there's another way The nine didn't hear that prayer. But the three who were there, they heard. In such authentic, God, not not whatever you want, God. I, I follow, if it's possible. This is heavy. They, they saw the anguish on his face. It says, he said to them, my soul is crushed with grief. Think about the moments in your life where it's been so bitter and so painful that you didn't need a prayer committee. You you needed a few. You didn't trust this with everybody. You didn't trust the doubt with them. You just said unspoken. You said nothing at all. But it's bad. It's not good. And you don't know how it's going or if it's going to get better. You don't know if you have the energy or motivation to do anything. To make it better. You don't, you don't know. You're just kind of lost in it. Who are the people that you could be lost around and you know you're loved and you know that they're going to anchor down with you and you know that they're going to remind you of the character of God and you know that they're going to speak to the goodness of God and you know they're not going to say, I'm going to pray for you, but they're in that moment going to put their hands on you and they're going to start praying and they're going to keep praying and when you leave and they walk away from their hands, they're going to still keep their hands open and they're going to pray 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 and they will not quit because they're your few and God has assigned to them the joy of being the watchman on the watchtower for you. Do you have a few? you see this is normal christianity all this other show up for the show stuff that's that is a gimmick that that is not what it's really about this this is the heart of it it's that you would know through a people that you are loved by a god that knows you intimately that cares for you deeply that demonstrates his love actively to you that you would know it not not from like i heard about it but you would see it lived out as god worked through a few in your life to show you his constancy and his faithfulness and his goodness and his love. So I refuse to go back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been a mega church preacher. And if God ever makes any of this mega or whatever it's called, we will not do church by the mega church rule book anymore. We will break out and pray and go over in services when it's time to go over. We, I, 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 we'll, 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 no, 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 no. We, 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 you will not plop in this church and hide. You can heal if you're healing, there's a, there's a purpose to the season. But you, I, look, I don't need you to fill a seat. I'd rather you not just fill a seat and sit in here and do nothing. Don't do that. Don't do that. If you don't want to be known, then leave here. I'm telling you, in this place, we want to know you. We want to know you. We want to know you. I don't care what the details are. We want to know you. So this is our drive. This is our aim, to be the kind of place where the least and the lost and the lonely 
find a people that are pursuing Christ-centered community. That's a light in the darkness in the, in the darkest moments of our life. So I'm surely hoping that in about a month and a half when we do a little group launch again, that more than 40% of the adults in this church make it a priority to get into a community group with a group of people so that maybe within that group as the Bible is open, the work of God's going on in that community, God could point out a few that could become that friend that's closer than a brother. I sure hope. I sure hope. If you need prayer, our prayer team's here. We'd love to pray with you and pray over you. Let's stand to our feet and let's respond as the Lord leads. In Jesus' name, amen.